Hello, um, my name is Alistair Mason. I am from a company called Scheffler. Um, if you haven't heard of Scheffler, don't worry, I'll tell you a little bit about Scheffler over the next couple of minutes. Um, and here, so topic of presentation, how Scheffler are helping to reduce emissions on um, today's vehicles. So it fits in quite nicely with what we were discussing earlier. Um, but I'll have the other thing there. So, um, just to run through what we're going to talk about, quite quickly, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the company. Um, then some of the um, challenges and trends that manufacturers are seeing today. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about our LUK brand, okay, um, and how some of, those, some of those products are actually helping reduce emissions on vehicles. Then we go into our ENA brand um, and how some of those are helping reduce emissions, and then the same with our FAG brand. That'll take us quite nicely then into uh, Scheffler and mobility for tomorrow's vehicles. So, um, Scheffler, quite a large, privately owned German company. Scheffler actually own LUK, looking after all our transmission components. Uh, Ina at the bottom there, looking after all our engine components. And then FAG in the middle, looking after all our chassis components. Um, now, our predominant business, okay, is to manufacture new components for the vehicle manufacturers, okay? Then we will run production of those. They will go direct to their production lines. That is then where the products are fitted onto the vehicles on the production line. We will then run production again for a second time. That will then be sent to their warehouses, out to their dealerships, into their parts departments, and then into their workshops. And then a couple of years after that, we'll run production again for a third time. That will then come to us into our warehouses, out to our motor factors, and then out uh, to you guys in the aftermarket. So in the aftermarket, you are getting exactly the same product as the product that we are manufacturing for the vehicle manufacturers. So um, the business is split basically two ways. Um, good news for us is two thirds of it of the company is automotive, so we get more money for research and development and going forward. So we are supplying transmission components uh, under the LUK brand to the vehicle manufacturers, the same um, on the engine under the ENA brand, then FAG under the. Uh, FAG um, looking after our chassis components and then we are supplying the same components into the aftermarket, not only the components but also repair solutions. So you're looking at the tooling, the information, everything around that product that we can support you with, we will. Um, and in some cases you're also getting a better product in the aftermarket. You think the manufacturers have been road testing that product now for us for the last two, three, four years. If there's any way we can make it better or any problems we've come across, we will always make that product better. We will always then put that in the box for the aftermarket. So you're always getting the best product. Uh, if you look to the right hand side, as you can see here, this is predominantly bearing te technology, ENA and FAG. Um, basically, if it moves in this world, we've generally got something to do with it. As you can see at the moment, you look at the top there, we're heavily involved with wind power, uh, also uh, hydro power generation as well. So we're also looking at new en energy sources going forwards. So, um, as a company, some figures from last year, just thought I'd share with you. Um, Scheffler Group sales worldwide 14.2 billion euros, okay. Uh, Scheffler Group employees worldwide 92,500. Um, so, in research and development, we've got um, over 8,000 people um, and around about 20 research and development centres. Uh, the patents filed last year um, were 2,400 and in total, our active patents and patents registered, as you can see there, 26,600 as it stands at the moment. So we're, we're quite an active company in that area. Um, where we really pride ourselves is where you're actually carrying out repair, especially in the aftermarket. We will put everything in the box that you need to carry out that repair, um, especially crucial around bearings and, and steering suspension. So if you remove a bolt, we'd like to put a new one in the box for you. Okay. Um, if you decide you'd actually like, rather keep that box, uh, bolt in your toolbox, this is potentially what can happen. Okay, and then if you go with some sort of copy parts, this is potentially what could happen. So um, we like to sort of, you know, favour our products there. So that's predominantly what we do, okay, where it's fitted on a vehicle. Uh, we manufacture for 98% of the vehicle manufacturers, 2% that we don't manufacture for, they probably just copy our products. Um, and your average car on the road, your average car out there today will have at least 60 different Scheffler components fitted to it. Take a note of that slide, we might see that a little bit later on. So, um, the challenges and trends that the manufacturers are having, and I think we all know, top right hand side there, yeah, the challenge they've got at the moment is emissions, and it is all about reducing emissions on vehicles. Um, so, the, basically what's going on with the engines is we know over the years engine torque has gone up and up and up. We've got a lot more power coming out of the engines now. Everything now needs to be that bit stronger to cope with that. 
Um, we're bringing in all that power, so more power. Our, our torque curve actually is quite short now. As you can see, all that extra power is coming in at low RPM. The reason behind that, we don't want to rev the engine. Okay? If we're revving the engine, we put more fuel in, we get more emissions coming out. So that works hand in hand really with down speed in the engine and also using higher gear ratios. So you think now, um, a colleague earlier was saying about his little mini clubman, okay? Um, you know, he would have been going down the motorway screaming at a fourth gear, which would have been top gear, 70 miles an hour, okay? Um, today, my van parked outside there, yeah, I'll go down the same road, same road speed, sixth gear, and literally just above tick over. So less fuel going in, less emissions coming out. And obviously, um, systems on the vehicles now, they're more sensitive. That is where then basically we're protecting that with dual mass flywheels. The other reason we're using dual mass flywheels is we're downsizing the engine, yeah? We're getting less and less cylinders. Because we're getting less cylinders, the vibration on the engine, okay, the pulses coming from the crankshaft, we're getting quite a lot of those pulses coming through. We absorb those with a dual mass flywheel. It's not being transmitted into the rest of the car and also gives us um, a nice, smooth, refined drive. Um, good news as well, fuel consumption is getting better, okay, with all this new technology. We've also got to bear in mind driver expectations. They want a nice, smooth car, okay, no rattles, no harshness, anything like that. Got to be cheap to run, got to be reliable, low on tax, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, let's have a look at the LUK brand. How does the LUK brand help reduce emissions on um, cars of today? So, um, clutch plate there, okay, um, something we all recognise. We've got some springs in the middle, it's actually a dampened clutch plate. So, if we look at the evolution of that, um, Henry Ford bought out his Model T Ford, had an engine, yeah, it wasn't particularly refined, had a clutch, had a gearbox, had an axle, yeah, you see the videos of that driving along, the person sat behind it, we all shaking away with it. And we actually thought if we could take some of that vibration away from the engine, stop it being transmitted into the rest of the transmission system, we'd make it a little bit smoother. So we've actually got a dampened clutch plate there. We can actually get about 18 degrees of movement on that clutch plate, which actually helps absorb the vibration. And that was fine until we got to about 1985. That's when diesels became more popular. We started using turbochargers. We're actually starting to increase compressions on engines. The power strokes then on these engines were a lot stronger. And 18 degrees of movement wasn't enough. So actually, we thought, yeah, if we can use some more springs, maybe some bigger springs, where can we put those? Oh, look, they fit quite nicely inside a dual mass flywheel. So that is where the dual mass flywheel came from. So construction of a flywheel, as you can see, we've got our ring gear connected to our primary mass. Inside that, we put our springs, what we call arc springs. And as that's going round, it's driving against those springs. Then as we've got the vibration, the springs compress and expand, compress and expand driving against that drive plate, which should now rotate in a nice smooth manner, okay, which is then connected to our secondary mass, which is then which our clutch is fitted to, so it should be a nice smooth transmission out to our gearbox. And that's where the dual mass flywheel um, was at for, for many years after that. And that was all good till we got to about 2008 and we bought out um, BMW, Efficient Dynamics, took a lot of weight off the car weight, by removing that weight, but then vibration and harshness started to come through. So we had to then change some more parts. So inside, a bit of aircraft technology. And on the drive flange in the center, we actually put some um, centrifugal pendulum weights. As you can see, this is what they look like. And a little animation of how they operate. There we go. So when we've still got a bit of vibration coming through, and it's actually getting now onto that drive flange, by fitting these weights, they're swinging in the opposite direction, counteracting that vibration and actually giving us pretty much 100% smooth transmission through to the other side. And then as the RPM comes down, you'll notice then, okay, less centrifugal force going out and they'll actually roll then in their full distance. And that is how we stopped um, more vibration coming through on the BMWs, and there we go. Um, today, what we're seeing now, the latest thing we've actually done is now put the centrifugal weights onto clutch plates. Okay, so any vibration at the clutch plate itself, that is then being counteracted by these pendulum weights, giving us a nice smooth transmission to the other side. So to demonstrate this, I need to pick on somebody in the audience. Sir, at the front, Look very good. Okay, so can you tell me what um, the car was you've had when you passed your driving test? A Fiesta. A Fiesta, fantastic. So definitely I didn't have a dual mass flywheel, nice solid flywheel in there, great stuff. And you'd be driving home and you start to go up a hill and at what sort of RPM did you think that sort of vibration and harshness would start to come in and that's the point to change down the gear? Uh, probably about 
Close, close, about 1800 I reckon it was. There you go, okay. So this is where it's all smooth, right? We have nice high RPM here, and as the RPM comes down and down and down and down, okay, once we start to go above that line, that is where all the vibration and harshness kicks in. So about 1800 RPM, okay. Um, and back in those days, you might not have realized this, but you're actually using 6.3 liters of fuel every 100 kilometers that you traveled. So anyway, time progressed on, things were all going good, you know, you've got your suit sorted and you're looking good and you want a car now with a dual mass flywheel, don't you? So, right, so you're going along, going up the same hill. At what sort of RPM now do you think you change down the gear? 1500, very good, we're getting closer, 1300 RPM I reckon it was. Okay, so a car with a dual mass flywheel, so we can now go further up that hill until we need to change down, okay, because that dual mass flywheel is taking that vibration and harshness away. Now the good news then, okay, we're only using now 5.4 litres of fuel every 100 kilometres we were travelling. Then we got to about sort of 1990 and you bought one of these BMW efficient dynamic things, yeah, it's got a dual mass flow, it's a centrifugal pendulum absorber. And you get to the same hill, you know, you're going down, you know, living the dream now, aren't you? You're going up this hill. Uh, what sort of RPM now do you think you changed down? Spot on, spot on, getting better at this game, aren't you? There you go, right, get up the hill, 1,000 RPM, and that's where the vibration and harshness kicks in, okay? And now you're only using 4.9 litres of fuel every 100 kilometres. So you're using less fuel, by using less fuel, you're actually now reducing the emissions on your vehicle. So, um, other things we've been involved with, 2008, um, this is where we introduced double clutch transmission, okay? Um, how does this help reduce emissions? Well, basically, um, it's a manual gearbox, so it is probably um, one of the most efficient gearboxes you can get, but it's actually being controlled by a computer, okay? So it is always in the right gear at the right time. The other thing with it, because it's double clutch, we're either, we've, we've pre-selected the next gear. Now, to change gear, all we're doing is flicking between one clutch and the other. That takes 0 0.02 of a second to change gear. How long does it take you to change gear in a manual car? A lot longer than 0 0.02 of a second. Because of that, when we're driving the car, we're tending to put our foot down to, say, 30%, 40% on the throttle, okay? Um, and then you're keeping a constant rev, okay? And because of that, then you see the engine revs are going up a little bit, then change the gear, just drop a little bit and come back up, okay? If it was a manual car, you would be accelerating, so you'd be on rich mixture, then you come off the throttle to change, so you go back to a weak change gear, reapply, back to a rich mixture. It's not helping with emissions. With this system, you're generally using a constant throttle until you get to the speed you want to get to, and then you're just maintaining that speed. We also get the same with constantly variable transmission. Now, this came out a little bit earlier. This was back end of the 90s, but we're still using a constant throttle by doing that, helping to reduce the emissions on cars. So what we're seeing, double clutch transmission is definitely, definitely a growing market. We're seeing sales of these going up 10% year on year. Just to give you an indication in the aftermarket, uh, we sold in 2017 just over 1,000 double clutch kits to the aftermarket. Okay, 2018, we sold over 5,000. That's, that's how many of these vehicles we're now seeing in the garages. So as it stood in 2018, there were over 18 million vehicles on the road with dry double clutch transmission. This is in Europe. Okay, and over 18 million vehicles on the road in Europe with wet <coughs> double clutch transmission. Um, also, we're now making clutches electric. Okay, um, the, the, the beauty of this, we can actually now engage and disengage the clutch to give us coasting or sailing, as they call it. So when we can actually turn the engine off if we're going down a slight incline. Um, we can basically turn the engine off, we can disengage it, turn the engine off, and that is helping to reduce emissions. Also, with stop-start systems, okay, where you're sat there and you've got your foot, you have to basically pull the car into neutral and take your foot off the clutch, and then the engine will stop. Okay, with this system, we can actually just keep our foot on the clutch and the engine will stop under a stop-start situation. So that's it, predominantly for LUK brand, Ina. Um, Ina all started back in 1936 by George Scheffler himself, and where it all started was he actually designed needle roller bearing, but actually put it in a cage. That separated the rollers. They weren't running against one another. Because of that, it made that bearing more efficient. Because that bearing is now more efficient, that bearing was then used in transmission systems, then went over into valve train technology, um, and as you can see, he went out on the road, and that's basically where he started selling bearings from a small case like that. Today, hopefully you recognize a couple of these pictures, so we obviously re we're looking after engine components, we're looking after timing systems and front-end auxiliary drive. Um, we are using the most efficient bearings that we can in those systems, okay? Um, there's no drag to those bearings or anything like that, so that is helping to reduce the emissions and making the engines more efficient. 
Um, valve train technology, we're heavily involved with valve train technology. As you can see, so we've basically got camshaft phases, um, um, variable valve timing, um, the latest thing now, uh, so we've got switchable, switchable followers, switchable cams, the latest thing now, UniAir system, that's our fir first step towards a camshaftless engine. Um, that is infinitely variable valve, um, valve timing, valve duration, valve lift, um, and has its own control unit that controls that. Uh, also under the inner brand, we're looking after cooling systems. As we can see here, um, our good old friend, the mechanical water pump that's being driven all the time, unfortunately, is slowly dying off. Manufacturers, vehicle manufacturers don't want that. Why are we pumping cold coolant around a cold engine? Yeah, we don't need to. What we want to do is we want that coolant to get hot. We want it to get up to temperature as quick as we can so we can come off that rich mixture and go to a nice sort of lambda one value. So what we're starting to see now is switchable pumps, okay? Uh, and also electric pumps, and then we see the one at the top there, thermal management unit, okay, that is one of probably the, la the latest innovations with cooling systems, used on um, the Audi um, TFSI engines, also used on um, BMWs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So here's a view of some of the switchable pumps, so the one at the far end there, that one is vacuum operated, we just put a vacuum to it, that shield comes out, it covers the impeller, the impeller's still going around but it's not circulate, circulating any coolant. Once it starts to get up to temperature, we remove that vacuum, that shield goes back in and we can now circulate the coolant around the engine. The other ones are sort of electrically controlled, being controlled by the engine control, and as soon as we get up to temperature, okay, we can then engage that water pump and start circulating the coolant around the engine. Um, this is the latest now, okay, thermal management units, uh, so the one on the left there, that is what I call generation one, that is still driven off a belt, still driven off the engine just to circulate, uh, just to turn the impeller. Uh, the other one there on the right hand side, that is like what I call generation two, that is now electric pump with thermal management unit. So, to go into this a little bit deeper, um, when we've got a thermal management unit on it, what we're going to do, we're going to start the car, what we're actually going to do there is the little valve, okay, um, rotary valve two, what we're going to do, we're just going to open that slightly, just to allow a little bit of coolant to go through there. So what happens, the engine starts, impellers going around, it circulates some coolant through the rotary side, through the cylinder head, so it's going straight through the cylinder head, out the other side, and then it's going to basically go through the turbocharger. When it goes through the turbocharger, that turbocharger gets red hot very, very quickly. So we're going to take the heat from the turbocharger, we're going to bring it around, and we're going to bring it back into the system, and just keep circulating it around until it gets up to temperature, and as it gets up to temperature, we're going to open rotary slide more and more and more, okay, and that is going to allow more coolant to circulate around. Now, should it be a cold morning, and we want the actual car to warm up quicker inside, what we're actually going to do is close rotary slide two, and we're going to pass that coolant through the heater matrix. So straight through the heater matrix, through the turbocharger, that's where it gets its heat. We're going to bring it back around, back into the pump, and back through the heater matrix again. So as it's circulating around, it's getting up to temperature a lot, lot quicker. Now, by using thermal management system, we can help to reduce the emissions by about 30%. Um, the cabin temperature gets up to temperature 50% faster. Um, then, once we're actually running with this vehicle, um, we actually, if it's under normal driving, we are cruising down the motorway, down the dual carriageway, we'll run this engine at 107 degrees, okay? We'll run it a lot hotter, that's making the, the, um, the oil a lot hotter, a lot thinner, that is where the engine is running at its most efficient, okay? Um, then you want some performance, what happens, you get a phone call, you need to be somewhere, you want some performance, what we actually do then, you start to put your foot down, um, the engine control unit will recognise this, what it'll actually do then is it will adjust the internal um, slide on the thermal management unit, it'll introduce more cold coolant, we'll actually bring that temperature down, the coolant temperature and the engine temperature down to about 85 degrees. By doing that it actually cools the combustion chambers in the car, by cooling and we're now getting better performance. Um, by doing that then we don't need to adjust the mixture on the car, we can continue running that car at lambda one. Now we, we were talking earlier about meeting the latest emissions targets, part of that is to be able to run a car at lambda one for X amount of time, for something like 40 miles or something like that. Um, by using these systems, we can now actually start to meet these emissions targets. So I've got a little video here. Um, unfortunately, there's no sound, so I'm going to have to talk you through it. So that is the body of our thermal management unit. Um, as you can see, most stuff these days is made of plastic. It's quite strong plastic. It's not paddling pool plastic anymore. Um, it's basically, it's, it's good resistance against corrosion. Um, which works well in, in cooling systems. It's actually light as well and it's good with heat. 
So as you can see, inside we've got printed circuit board, so that's giving us feedback. So engine control unit is controlling it, it's controlling that motor, which is basically inside then rotating two rotary slides. So this side, you can see, this is where we have the impeller. The impeller is being driven by a belt off the balance shaft of the engine. So these are our rotary slides inside. You can see we're running, we've got to run seals on these. These are the latest in seal technology. It's silicon carbide seals. Um, and as these rotary slides rotate, so we've got rotary slide one, rotary slide two, okay, they are controlled by the motor. They control the amount of flow and then also the amount of, and where that coolant is going to and then also the amount of cold coolant coming in from the radiator. So, we're going to basically fill this up with coolant. It's going to be cold. There you go, blue cold coolant. We're going to start the car, and hopefully the impeller's going to go around. There we go. Okay, so cold engine. Okay, as, as you can see, it's starting to get up to temperature. We're going up to temperature. The coolant is now changing colour. It means it's getting hotter. Okay, what we're going to do, if you watch over on the side here, what we're actually going to do, we're going to open up the engine oil cooler. So that coolant is nice and hot now, as you can see it's above 100 degrees. So we're now going to open up the oil cooler, get hot, cool, hot coolant going around your oil cooler. That brings the engine oil up to temperature better. Now as you can see we're getting sort of pretty much red hot here now. Okay, um, we get introducing cold coolant now from the radiator. So part load, now we're cruising. We're cruising down the motorway, that is as hot as we can get it, 107 degrees, bringing in cold coolant as well. Okay, now we've got wide open throttle. We want some performance, more cold coolant coming in. We're bringing that temperature down, okay, bringing that down to 85 degrees. That's cooling our engine. That's giving us better burn inside the engine, giving us more performance, allowing us to run at lambda one. Now we're basically coming off the throttle. We're back to cruise. We're adjusting it again, restricting this flow and bringing that temperature back up, okay? Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, good. <laughs> Okay, um, so that's the Ina brand, okay, and then FAG brand. So, wheel bearings, what can we do with wheel bearings? How do they affect the emissions on cars? Well, quite simply, the first thing we did is we actually carry out um, a, a process called orbitally forming. And this is where we basically bring a machine into the bearing, so we've got our inner race coming through, which is actually part of our drive flange. We bring that through, and we have extra material on the top. We bring a machine in, and it rolls around and around, and actually mushrooms it over. We bring a press down, and that actually presses it, and actually presets that preload on that bearing. Okay, so that bearing is set to the correct tension before it even leaves our factory. So when people are bolting it in, they're not going to bolt it, do it up too tight, too loose, or anything like that. It is preset before it leaves us, so it is always running at its optimum. The other thing we're doing now is, um, this is for BMWs predominantly, um, we've got what we call a face spline there. Actually, you can see, so instead of having the splines inside the bearing, okay, we've now got them on the back of the bearing. You can see that's quite a, quite a, lar that's a larger diameter. Because it's a larger diameter, we can actually transmit more torque through there. 50, up to 50% more torque. Also then, we don't have a drive shaft going through the middle. Because we don't have a drive shaft going through the middle, we've managed to sort of cut off sort of like four or five inches of, of drive shaft either side. Okay, that is helping to reduce the weight on the vehicle. Also, uh, you'll notice here on this side, we now have low, what we call low friction seals. Okay, there is no resistance to that seal. It is free to turn, although it still seals the bearing, there's no resistance. That is, makes the car easier to roll along because it's easier to roll along when using less fuel to propel it. Um, and that's pretty much where we are really, okay, um, with what we do to reduce emissions. Um, so the next step forward really is to, is to sort of put some electrification onto these vehicles. And this is where we're sort of looking at what we call mobility for tomorrow. So I said remember that slide earlier, so that was our portfolio. As you can see our portfolio has now changed slightly. Um, we have, we're looking at sort of three systems. We're looking at what we call a P0, a P2 and a P4. So P0 we're looking um, mild hybrid, okay, um, sort of generally 48 volt systems. P2, um, we're talking mild hybrid and, and normal hybrid vehicles. Um, so we're talking 48 volts and we're talking um, normal, you know, normal hybrid voltage. And then P4, we're talking full electric, we're talking electric axles. Okay. So we're just going to take, um, take a sort of closer look at some of these systems. Um, I've basically got as much information from Germany as I can. P0, not too bad. Hybrid, we're struggling a little bit. Electric axles, we're struggling a little bit more. But that's the Germans for you. So um, this is P0. Okay. Um, so this is what we call like a starter generator. So P0, mild hybrids. So they have gone now from 12 volt to 48. That seems to be the, 
Um, seems to be the way it's all gone. Okay, so we've gone from three kilowatts up to 12 kilowatts. Why do we use 48 volts? Why, quite simply, um, it's a safe voltage to work with. It's now been standardized as well. Um, it all came from um, Dame LeBenz himself. He wanted to work with the system. Um, he wanted to work with a voltage. He then got other manufacturers to come in as well and say, look, you know, let's agree on a voltage. They agreed on 48 volts. They could then bring in other companies. Um, you were then supplying these components in, and they would work with 48 volts as well. Um, so the P0 system, it gives you um, start via belt drive, okay, once the vehicle is up to temperature. Um, obviously recuperation, so we're charging and, recu and getting re recuperation from there. And it's, all given us, and it's also giving us e-boost, okay, when we want extra power, stick our foot hard to the floor, that, actually, that motor will kick in and it will actually give the engine some boost. Um, also used on hybrid electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, um, just to use to actually start the engine, okay, we just use that system. Um, now, one of the advantages of this is low cost and quite simple f to fit, yeah, for the vehicle manufacturers. So if we look at it, so you imagine the vehicle manufacturers are manufacturing these cars at the moment, they're all going down the production lines, all of a sudden now new emissions targets to meet. Crikey, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? I'll tell you what we do, let's stick a, a mild hybrid system on it. So as it's going down the production line, we don't have to change a great deal. Um, we've still got a 12 volt battery, we need to put a 48 volt battery onto the vehicle. Okay, um, we need to put a DC-DC converter and where the alternator was located, we remove the alternator and we put our starter generator system on there. So as you can see, not a great deal of cost and, not, and they don't have to change the production of the vehicle that much to actually help to reduce the emissions on the vehicle. Now, um, we do get some challenges, so we fit these new systems, it all sounds fantastic, it's all easy, um, but unfortunately it does create some problems. So, when we think back to our alternators, they generally had an overrunning alternator pulley on them, yeah? And that helped take out the, pulse, the pulses that are coming from the crankshaft, okay? Um, that overrunning alternator pulley took those out and allowed the alternator to, to continue rotating at the speed that it wanted to, bearing in mind it's going four times the speed of the engine. Um, now we've gone to a starter gener generator, so not only is it being driven, but it is also a driver. So we now can't use an overrunning alternator pulley, we can't use that pulley now. So we have to go solid pulley, so how can we take, so now basically we're back to getting all these vibrations from the belt. Yeah, the belt starts whipping around again, what are we going to do? So what we've basically done is we have got a mini dual mass flywheel on the front of the engine. We love dual mass flywheels that much, we're now fitting two on the vehicle. So, we put a, basically a vibration damper on the front pulley, those springs inside there absorb those vibrations. Um, then we've looked at it even more, and actually on a hot summer's day, you pull up at the traffic light, stop, start, intervention kicks in, engine stopped, okay, but we still want air conditioning. So actually, if we can disengage that pulley so it's free to spin, fire up our e-motor, okay, that's then turning the belt, which is turning our air conditioning compressor, our bottom pulley's free to spin, okay, we can get full air conditioning without the vehicle even running. Now, um, looking at the tensioner side of things, um, we now need to put more tension, a lot more tension onto this belt if we're using this, this 48 volt system. So we're tensioning either side, but when this is being driven, our slack span is moving one way and our tight span um, to the other side, and then when we want e-boost, that tight and slack span are, are moving to the other side. So we've now got to build a tension that's tensioning the belt on both sides and, is, and can also move. So, we've got, this is what we call our Omega Tensioner, so you can see on Start um, or E-Boost, as you can see, our tight span is before the starter generator and our slack span is after. Then in our nominal position, okay, everything's free, it's all in a nominal position. And then when we go to recuperation or charging, as you can see, our slack span is before and our tight span is now after that unit. So, many tensioners we looked at, we looked at twin tensioner systems, but they weren't that good. Then we went into our Omega tensioners, and they actually work quite well, um, and they're actually pretty sort of um, price competitive. And then we can actually even go over into active tensioners or electronic actuators, but obviously there's the price involved with that. So most of the manufacturers, uh, vehicle manufacturers, are wanting to go with this system. So small animation here. So as you can see, um, that's our tensioner. Then we're going to take the cover off, and you'll see the springs inside, which actually hold that tension hard into the belt, and as you can see it's bolted to the, to the starter generator and it's now free to move. So that's with the car just idling, nominal position. Then we're going to put it into recuperation so it's charging, so you can see we've still got the tension on the belt but it's allowed to spin one way. Uh, 
And then we go into e-boost or start, and as you can see, the tension can spin the other way, allowing the tight and slack span to move. So, um, doing that, now you've basically got to bear in mind we've put a lot more tension onto this belt. Okay, there's a lot more force going through this belt. So, what we've had to do, we've looked at the crankshaft, and the crankshaft now on our, um, on our main bearings, our, our normal main bearings, our white metal bearings, aren't actually strong enough to cope with that. So, the first bearing, we're actually now using a roller bearing system. Okay, that can actually t can, um, sort of cope with more tension, more stress on it. Okay, and protects the other bearings as well. So um, you've got to bear these things in mind. Next thing we've got reinforced belts. We're now actually introduced Kevlar into, into our auxiliary drive belts, so there's more strength to them. Um, and the other thing we've got to look at as well is the size of the pulleys. There is a minimal size we can go down to, um, down to. Because of belt slippage, we get a certain amount of slippage, we can only go down to a certain size on the pulleys. We can't go any smaller, so there are minimum sizes that we can use for those. Um, the other thing we've got to look at is, so when we're using a starter generator system, the amount of pulses that are actually being produced from there. Now, if we, so, as you can see here, belt-assisted starting, and that's the resonance that comes out. So we have to put this vibration damper on there. This is where we're putting our pulley decoupler. With that fitted, as you can see, it reduces a lot of the vibration that's being transmitted through. The next problem we had is we actually designed our pulley decoupler, our mini dual mass flywheel. Um, but that has to be mated with the dual mass flywheel on the other side of the engine. Otherwise, if those two vibrations that they're working against um, don't marry up, basically the car won't start. So um, there was a lot of development around these, these two systems. So sort of in summary, um, what we get with the P0, okay, we can get up to 7% 7, 7 fuel saving. Like we say, it's low cost and easy to install. We can get between 15 to 25 brake horsepower of e-boost. Um, and the pulley decoupler apparently is good for one million start stops. Okay, so the bottom pulley there is good for up to one million start stop scenarios. So moving on now, so now we're going to go to our, um, our P2 hybrid module. Um, as you can see, that's where it's located. So you've got to bear in mind we manufacture these components for the vehicle manufacturers, so we're offering them solutions. So our P2 um, use, uh, can give us up to 350 newton meters of torque, so quite a powerful little unit. Combine that with the internal combustion engine, we can actually get up to 800 newton meters of torque out of that, which is actually quite a lot of power. Um, we can use this in 48 volt and high voltage applications. Um, we still have a mechanical damper, yeah? We've still got our internal combustion engine, and then we still have this, yeah? Dual mass flywheel, lovely, I'm not out of a job yet. Okay, coupled up to then our, um, our hybrid module. Um, this can also act as an electrical damper, so any final vibration that is still coming out, we can actually accelerate and decelerate that hybrid module at the relevant time to give us 100% smooth transmission coming out. Um, can easily be coupled to automatics and double clutch technology as well. Uh, easily adapted for all car manufacturers and we also have an integrated clutch which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, we also offer this in a, in a sort of low voltage in a uh, 48 volt scenario. So this is how it sort of started life. Um, basically, it has a 48 volt motor there on the outside. Okay, belt drive system through. We had an Omega tensioner inside, uh, tension in that belt. And we had two electric clutches on there, <coughs> connecting and dis well, engaging and disengaging um, the engine and also um, the clutch system as well. Um, that was generation one. As you can see, we are already up to generation four. It's a lot more compact unit. You can look at the size of the motor. The motor's a lot smaller. We're actually now using a chain drive system. Chain drive system's a lot narrower, so we can actually now compress the size of that unit. Um, and it's also a lot more efficient as well. So you can see how technology is moving on um, at the speed that I can't keep up with. Um, so this is the latest um, P2 hybrid module. As you can see, the clutch is on the inside there. So you think when we're using this, we actually need clutches inside. Because at times, we want to only be using the engine. There's times when we want to disconnect the engine and only be using the hybrid module. And there's times when we want to be using engine and hybrid module, and we have to connect all clutches. It has also got a disconnect clutch in there um, for certain times of overrun to give us, give us coasting as well. So um, this, this motor here gives us roughly about 100 kilowatts of output, produces about 350 newton meters of, of torque. Okay. Um, so this is just one, one that's been exploded, new image that I found, thought it was quite nice. So as you can see, this is obviously on a front wheel drive car, so you can see where the drive shafts are going to be coming out. 
So we've got our motor inside, and then you can see where all our sort of electronics and our control unit side of it is. Okay, just in the side, so we can quite easily get at that um, for any maintenance that should need to be carried out. Um, so sort of summarise on these a bit. Um, P2, quite easily adapted for the vehicle manufacturers, gives us up to 22% fuel saving. Um, we can get up to extra 800 newton metres of torque out of it. Um, it. Basically, we can use this for coasting for up to 100 miles an hour. Um, and we've got the old one-way clutch inside there as well to improve efficiency on that. Um, and that takes us quite nicely up to now our P4 hybrid, um, uh, like electric axles, okay? Um, so not much to tell you about these, to be honest. This sort of technology hasn't sort of um, come flying at me lately. Um, but basically what we're generally going to do, we're generally going to have two of these motors on there. Um, these motors, uh, 210 kilowatt, that basically breaks down to about 282 brake horsepower out of a zero emission vehicle. Um, the great thing with these as well, it gives us good, good um, stability of the vehicle, good, good torque vectoring. So when we steer in, we can put a little bit of power, extra power to the outside motor. Um, if we look at this, so we've got a small motor on the outside, that is to actually accelerate and brake on that particular side. That's the main motor there that gives us our, most of our power and it is running through an epicyclic gear train inside so we can actually gear it up. So I was talking to somebody the other day, driver Mitsubishi Outlander Fev, basically, and we talked about charging points earlier, they said, yeah, took it to a charging point. Um, basically, it takes them 15 minutes to charge it from pretty much zero up to like 90%. This is basically the time it takes to have a cup of coffee. Well, I can't even charge my mobile phone in that time. So, you know, you just think this technology is just moving on so quick. And they've got, what, 300 miles on that? So, um, so yes, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. So, um, e-axles now, um, where does that move to? Um, latest thing now, Audi, Audi e-tron, just about to be launched. Um, basically using our, our e-axles, um, 300 kilowatts um, power output there. So, yeah, equals about 400 brake horsepower, zero emissions again. Um, and that's about as much the information as I can get out of Audi as well. So. Um, other areas we've looked at, concepts we've been working with that possibly manufacturers can take. Um, E-wheel drive, why not, put, uh, why not put a motor inside the wheel, actually drive that wheel? So we've actually got a concept car, got a Ford Fiesta, um, we fitted these motors, so we've actually fitted them in the back wheels on this particular vehicle. So bearing in mind now this is zero emissions, um, we can actually, the floor pan of the car, because we have no drivetrain or anything like that, we can actually now um, have a flat floor in it, we can actually look at the configuration inside the car. Um, other things we got is basically um, we don't have drive shafts. <coughs> because we don't have drive shafts, there's nothing to stop us turning those wheels 90 degrees. Yeah, see a parking space, fancy that parking space, lock it over, 90, all four wheels 90 degrees and just side shift straight into that space. Yeah, a lot easier to park the car. Um, um, basically, there, there are some challenges with it as well. Okay, um, it, it handles the characteristics of this car with all these different weights, it's completely different. Um, there's a lot more weight inside the wheel, so the bearings need to be as, as good as we can get them. We've got to look at, we can actually do the braking through the electric motors, but there needs to be a secondary braking system. And the other thing is, we also need to control this power. Now, if you think, these two motors on there, when we put our foot hard to the floor, it equals about 115 brake horsepower. Now, potentially, this car can wheelie down the road. So we actually have to throttle back some of that electrical power before it actually, so it doesn't get full torque all in one go. Um, moving on from that, so we're talking e-wheel drive. Yes, this concept seems quite nice. What can we do there? We're actually now making modules, okay, corner modules. So the way we see it going, um, we've got some of these in development. Actually, some of these are being driven around. Um, we are using these as called what we're calling the Scheffler Mover. So it's basically, it's a platform. Okay, this vehicle here, you're going to get your mobile phone, you're going to tap the app, okay, and this is going to arrive, it's going to be fully autonomous, okay, um, it's going to be controlled on four of these, these e-wheel modules, um, you're going to get into it, okay, and it's going to drive you about. Um, then, actually, why don't we use them to move stuff around the city, these bigger cities, yeah, so it's fully electric, fully autonomous, we can actually do deliveries in them, as you can see, we can do cold deliveries as well, um, so fantastic little thing we're developing at the moment. <clears throat> and then Scheffler itself, okay, we've been quite busy um, with Formula E, yeah, um, if you've if you watched this, yeah, it's like big boy scale electrics, um, you, hopefully you'll see the Scheffler card somewhere near the front, um, and we've done alright at this, um, 2016, 2017, yeah, let's get this right, we won the Drivers' Championship, Lucas Degrassi, so we did something right that year, uh, 2017, 2018, we won the Drivers' Championship, uh, the 
which I was the manufacturer's championship, sorry. Um, so we're obviously doing something right, but this is where we're looking at this technology and bringing it on. Um, so then we've looked at that, um, and we've taken the motors out of the, out of the Formula E car. Um, why put two motors in there when you can put four? So we put four motors, okay, into this, into this Audi A3 or S3. Um, these motors, basically 220 kilowatts each, okay. Four of those, we've now got 880 kilowatts of power coming out of this car. What's that mean in, our, in, our, in English like? Um, that means that's 1,200 brake horsepower, basically, out of a zero emission vehicle. Um, so where do we see this going? What, what, you know, what are they saying about it? Well, over here, number one, okay, so internal combustion engine and hybrid vehicle, they're going to be with us for, for a good while yet. Yeah, um, we know that, so we're just working hard on making everything as efficient as we can. Um, number two there, electric vehicles, okay, so electric cars, yeah, and, and the technology on that is moving forward. Um, at a great rate of knots. Um, I don't really think distance is too much of a restriction on them now, um, and the time it takes to charge them, um, not a problem. So we've still, got, we've still got like one or two for long distance, yeah. Um, then we go into the city, okay, we start looking, so we've got our Scheffler mover, okay, so that's good for sort of short distances around the cities, busy cities and towns. Um, then we've got our sort, of, our sort of people carriers here, so we've got like a, an e-board, an electric skateboard. Now, all the roads are busy, yeah, if you go down to London, go in the middle of Birmingham, wherever, yeah, the roads are busy. So why don't we build some lightweight roads above that just to carry people on? So actually, why can't we just go on there with our little e-board, just get us to where we want to go, okay, get to the office, put our board on our, on our charging um, platform and go into the office and do it and go about our work. Or in the morning, actually, fancy a little bit of exercise so you can get on your little bio-hybrid, very much like an old Sinclair C5, but this time you will get your, your phone, you'll put it on the dash pod of the car, Okay, you'll say, I'd like to do a little bit of exercise, and you'll say, right, and I'll say, you need to do X amount this morning, and I'll pedal so far, and then you'll calculate how many calories I've burnt, okay, at that point then you'll say, fantastic, give me a thumbs up, okay, I will stop pedaling, and it will take me electrically to where I need to get to, um, I will then just sort of bring that into the office and put that on its charging pod, um, whoever's going out for lunch can then jump on it and use it that way as well, so, um, that is what we're saying, and we're saying that's going to happen by about the year 2050, yeah? Um, and there you go, we have got to the end. So, um, thank you for your time. Um, are there any questions? Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.